There are so many options to choose from when playing Necromancer. Crying about low benchmarks, playing raids 1v9 with Heal Scourge, role playing as the God of Death, or just getting kicked from groups for playing the Forbidden Green class. Well, what if I told you you could do all of that in one build instead of having to choose? That's right, Plague Doctor Scourge combines all of the greatest elements of Necromancer together into one glorious package. In all seriousness, this is a strong build that works in many situations and is also highly engaging to play, combining the legendary Heal Scourge with Condition Scourge. The result of this unholy union is a build capable of dealing enough damage to expose your DPS player friends for not knowing their rotations very well, and simultaneously carry them all through all but the most extreme clown fiestas. Plague Doctor Scourge is also very self-sufficient, which means that it's great for solo play in open world, or handling isolating mechanics in raids, like kiting on both versions of Kadeem or Doom. And of course, thanks to the vast condition damage, you can spread the plague using Epidemic to demolish pesky foes while your allies tunnel vision the boss. As usual for Scourge, a lot of your power comes from traits and profession mechanics, and this gives you a lot of inherent flexibility, so it's easy to adapt to fit your needs by swapping utility skills. This means that you'll often find yourself handling multiple roles in a group at any given time, and you'll have to manage your cooldown usage carefully to maximize your effectiveness. A wrinkly brain is required to pilot the Plague Doctor successfully, even more so than the regular Thinking Man Scourge. So with that in mind, prepare yourself to learn the secret to one of my favorite builds. One last quick thing before we jump in though. The most common question I always get is, is this build better than hard carry heal scourge? And the answer is, it's situational. There are occasions where both setups outshine the other, and the key to answering that question is understanding the strengths and weaknesses of both builds. Fortunately, by the end of this, you'll know all of that. The gear for this build is in the name, Full Plague Doctor. Plague Doctor is an unusual attribute combination, but it works out well for us here. Condition damage and healing power are self-explanatory, big damage and big barriers. Vitality is also great because this build is aiming to do damage, so we take a Scepter, the Necromancer's ultimate condition weapon, but with the downside of not having the greatest life force generation. A massive health pool, and therefore a massive life force pool, prevents this from being much of an issue, as Scourge Shade skills have a fixed cost, but life force generation is still percentage based. More vitality, more juice. This massive vitality allows the Plague Doctor to always be able to use abilities when needed, while also being highly durable, surviving long enough to pick your team up off the floor. Concentration is a bit of a waste, as aside from some pathetic might from Blood is Power, the Doctor has no use of boons. However, because four attribute combos have a net larger amount of total attributes over three attribute combos, and there aren't really any other good alternatives, Plague Doctor is still the way to go. Shaman is more or less a worse Plague Doctor, and Marshall and Seraph, although bringing great damage to the table, will leave your life force pull woefully low without soul reaping, leading to a sad lack of button mashing. It turns out that Torment is extremely powerful now, so we have the amusing opportunity to get a Tormenting Rune as our best damaging option for some insane Torment duration, with the added upside of giving this build even more sustainability from the sixth bonus. Each stack of torment applied, of which we have many sources, will heal us for about 180 per stack applied, which is extremely powerful considering it has no internal cooldown, making this build even more immortal than it was before. As mentioned previously, we use a scepter in combination with a torch and a warhorn for our offhands. This gives the perfect blend of big damage and crowd control for break bars Attached to these weapons are a Torment Sigil on the Scepter to grab some more Torment stacks, Sigil of Demons on Torch maxing out Torment duration, and a Sigil of Paralyzation on Warm for just an extra bit of days. The Torment setup is pretty expensive, and while it will yield a bit more damage per second, if you are strapped for cash, go for Crate Runes with the Bursting and Earth Sigils on the weapons, which is not quite as much damage, but much more affordable. If you fancy an extra bit of gear optimization, throw in some condition damage infusions for maximum odds at putting a full DPS player to shame. 
Let's move on to consumables and no slacking here because ascended food is extremely powerful, particularly in this instance as devouring some mint and veggie flatbread adds the usual condition damage and condition duration, but also a 10% healing modifier for transfusion healing, and it also increases revival speed from transfusion and any wells of blood you might have. If you can't get the ascended, regular food like koi cakes are fine too. The perfect wrench or enhancement is, funnily enough, magnanimous tuning crystals for extra condition damage or writs of masterful malice if you like wasting gold. For specializations, it's the usual suspects. Blood magic, curses, and of course, scourge. Blood magic provides the unstoppable revive potential of transfusion and ritual of life, transfusion augmenting garish pillar with the disgusting power to revive allies and teleport them to you while they're in the downstate, allowing your wells of blood to revive them all at the same time. Be a bit careful when you use Transfusion, because this build doesn't run Soul Reaping, so Garish Pillar's cooldown is not reduced by the minor trait, Sinister Shroud. This means even with Alacrity, you'll still have downtime. If you get caught out and don't have the downstate pull available when allies are dropping like flies, then you are not doing your job. Blood Magic has a few extra secrets hiding in the minor traits too. Last Rites prevents your allies from bleeding out, which is actually a very strong effect, making it a fair bit easier to revive them, particularly when you're dealing with multiple casualties. And gives you more healing power, which empowers your barrier and transfusions even more. Last but not least is Vampiric Presence. It's the Necromancer's answer to a DPS buff, and it's not bad at all, actually. Your subgroup will steal life on their attacks with a half-second cooldown. It might not seem like much, but it'll add up over the course of an encounter. Curses is the trait line single-handedly carrying Condition Necromancer for a long time, containing some of the most outrageously powerful traits you'll find anywhere. Lingering Curse slaps a massive 200 condition damage on top of what you already have, increases the base duration of Scepter Conditions by 50%, and also causes Feast of Corruption to morph into Devouring Darkness, a devastating area of effect version of the skill that generates a bit more life force for each target hit. Needless to say, this is a rather good trait, and allows us to escape the grasps of Noodle DPS. Note that the 50% base duration increase is affected by any condition duration that you might have, meaning that the bleeds from Scepter end up at three times the normal duration. Master of Corruption is a beastly trait, reducing all corruption cooldowns by 33% and causing them to inflict an additional condition on the player. That might sound a bit rubbish, but actually it's a benefit, thanks to Plague Sending, which causes the first attack after entering Shroud to conveniently transfer two conditions to the target. The huge cooldown reduction and extra torment on Blood is Power turns the skill into a complete powerhouse of, well, power. The minor traits for curses are no slouch either. They are all focused on critical strikes and bleeding. Granting some bleeds on critical strikes, along with a massive 20% free bleed duration bonus, free precision, fury, and extra critical strike chance per condition on your target. This makes up for the lack of precision from our gear, and in a normal group setting will quite often result in a critical strike chance of over 50%, perfect for activating earth sigil and barbed precision. Of course, it wouldn't be much of a plague doctor without the infamous elite specialization, Scourge. Broadly, Scourge provides the foundation and backbone for our two previous specializations to function at maximum capacity. In particular, granting access to the power of sand, which gets everywhere as I understand it, condition cleanse from nefarious favor, barrier application from sand cascade, easy short cooldown transfusion access on garish pillar, and of course, desert shroud, which is mysterious seriously morphed into Harbinger Shroud, thanks to a new trait called Herald of Sorrow, which converts the Pulsing Shroud into a very different beast, which finds its unlikely purpose in Support Scourge. Harbinger Shroud grants barrier when activated, and then after three seconds explodes, dealing all its damage and torment in one burst, and corrupting two boons. On top of that, it applies a very strong barrier to all allies within your shades, massively increasing barrier output and leading to some absolutely disgusting combos with Sand Cascade that will cause even the squishiest player to survive even the deadliest onslaughts. 
especially fantastic for dealing with attacks that deal a percentage of the player's health, as these usually don't consider barrier, meaning your team can survive ordeals that are not meant to be survived. A while ago, the act of summoning a Sandshade had its cooldown substantially reduced. This reshuffle of Scourge was a big piece in the puzzle on actually enabling this build. The change means that we can reposition shades faster and have more shades up at any given time, allowing us to massively benefit from damage reduction and free expertise from our minor traits, and of course, allowing maximum targets to be blessed by the Plague Doctor. With all three shades placed, up to 12 targets will know the embrace of the Scourge, because of course the Necromancer themselves count as a shade, meaning that we don't need to take Sans Savant for the big shade. This coverage capability allows us to take a key damaging trait, Demonic Law, for 33% more torment damage, which is massive, and on top of that, some free burning too. The burning is triggered on torment application, so try to weave in a shade skill at least every three seconds to get maximum value. Rounding out Scourge is an excellent adapt trait, Fell Beacon. Using high damage torch skills more often is fantastic, but so is converting condition damage into expertise. This extra 9% or so, combined with the 15% from having shades out, and of course the 76% from gear and food, will set our torment duration to a beautiful 100%, bleeding to 50%, and all other conditions at 30%. However, sometimes damage per second is not your main concern. If you find yourself needing more condition cleanse, abrasive grit will help out with that a lot, and nourishing ashes is the key to truly infinite life force, so swap as necessary. With the gearing out of the way, let's talk about skills. In a nutshell, Scepter Torch does big damage, and Warhorn provides a bit of swiftness and crowd control. We'll talk about rotation and skill usage later, but that's the overall idea. The usual suspects for heal necro make their appearance at the start of the utility skill bar. Well of Blood as a heal skill should certainly be no surprise. Revive power is the big attraction of heal scourge and being able to double up with the active heal and a ritual of life heal well will make sure no matter how many times your allies feed, you'll have them back up ready to go immediately. Signet of Undeath is an incredible utility skill. A short cast time ranged revive is exactly what the Doctor ordered for retrieving players from deaths who are too far away to reach to revive normally before they meet their doom. It also passively generates a lot of life force too, thanks to the massive health pool. An interesting thing about Signet of Undeath is that it costs health to use, but it's a fixed amount, not a percentage, so it doesn't hurt that much. And it can also use barrier instead, so if you want to avoid taking health damage while going for a signet revive, then barrier up first. Blood is power has some big numbers on it. If you transfer the conditions it applies using Shroud, one cast will deal over 40,000 damage. About 40% of that is from the aforementioned transfer, so it's important to always try to land it. Use Shroud just before finishing the cast of Blood is Power to make that as likely as possible. If you don't get the transfer, be careful, as you can actually end up severely damaging yourself if you can't cleanse the inflicted conditions. Use Nefarious Favor to get rid of them as quickly as possible. The third utility slot is quite open. Here are most of the options and when you might use them. Epidemic is great for obliterating multiple targets or key secondary targets. Spectral Grass for pulling in enemies or massive break bar damage. Trail of Anguish is an excellent stun break and applies stability to allies too. Well of Corruption is a very powerful pulsing corrupt field. Corrosive Poison Cloud will shut down projectiles with excellent uptime thanks to Master of Corruption. And Sandswell, Fleshworm and Spectral Walk deliver fantastic mobility. If you're performing a very mechanic heavy role in a raid and need some extra usefulness, then drop blood is power. Your primary role is always making sure the encounter goes smoothly, not necessarily doing damage. That leads us into elite skills. There are two excellent choices to go for. The first is Plague Lands. Using it spawns a devastating pulsing field that deposits ever increasing amounts of conditions onto enemies unfortunate to be within it. Try to place it when enemies are unlikely to move for a while to get maximum damage. The alternative to this ability is Flesh Golem. Take this if your team is slacking horribly on break bars. Now that we know what to play, let's look at how to play it. The rotation for this build is very similar to the regular condition Scourge, and it essentially boils down to a simple priority. 
Keep three shades up as often as you can. Use scepter and torch skills off cooldown. Use desert shroud as often as possible and chain it with blood is power. Use plague lands when the target isn't going anywhere. And in between all of that, make sure not to cancel auto attacks. The final attack in the scepter chain is about twice as good as the others. So weaving auto attack chains in between abilities is very important. On the Golem, you can expect around 23 to 24,000 damage per second. So if you get close to that, you are probably pressing your buttons correctly. However, always remember the Plague Doctor is not just about damage. The support component is even more important, so don't be greedy. As soon as things destabilize, it's time to leap into action, and handling mechanics should always be your priority. The strength of this build is that it can do damage, heal, and do mechanics at the same time. If you're not getting value by performing multiple rolls at the same time, this build is just a bad version of either DPS Scourge or Full Heal Scourge. The magic of the hybrid is being able to do just enough of both to be better value than just running one or both of the more specialized builds. To round off this guide, here are a few key points to keep in mind when playing the build. You want to have at least two shades up on your group when using defensive skills, otherwise you won't have that much supportive impact. Shade management and positioning is very important. Shade skills activate around you too, so even without a shade you still have a presence, but it's significantly diminished, and casting multiple shades takes a bit of time to set up. Barrier is extremely powerful. Try to use Sand Cascade and Harbinger Shroud before damage happens. Save Transfusion for when allies might fall over. If you can get away with it, it's good pulsing healing, but make sure you won't need it to revive targets after it runs out. Transfusion will potentially pull down allies twice. Each unique target will be teleported to you on a 5 second interval, so if you catch a friend early on in Transfusion, they'll get pulled again later in the duration. Nefarious Favor converts a condition into a boon, making it particularly great when facing slow, chill, immobilize, fear, or burning, turning them into quickness, alacrity, resistance, stability, and aegis, respectively. Your number one priority is always carrying. I've been saying that a few times, but I really want to underline it here. Be ready to run around reviving players at a moment's notice. Awareness and knowledge of mechanics and your giant brain are your most powerful weapons. Use them wisely. This build has a lot of boon corruption power. This is excellent anywhere where opponents have boons, but some examples of this would be Kadim, Kadim the Peerless, Largos Twins, Doom, or Dragon Response Mission Challenge Modes. If you know enemies are likely to be covered in boons, then save your corruption skills like Devouring Darkness or Harbinger Shroud to ruin their day. Shade skills are usable while reviving, attacking, and even while stunned or feared, so don't let that stop you. In fact, these are some of the times where they are at their most powerful. Getting massive barrier while reviving your whole team is very important, as you can then resustain them as they get back up while continuing your work. Note that Nefarious Favor can remove fear for you and allies as fear is a condition. Finally, and possibly most importantly, don't die. This build is very survivable, but make sure you take good care of yourself. If you fall, then how can you give your team their medicine? In all seriousness, it's incredibly important to stay alive no matter what. If you don't, it defeats the entire purpose of any variant of Heal Scourge, or a support for that matter. Survive everything and prevent wipes. That concludes the guide. Practice hard out there and don't let me down, the reputation of Necromancer is at stake here, and I don't want to see any low energy Scourge gameplay. If you have any questions, leave them below or hop on board my stream. I play this build and all sorts of Necromancer degeneracy on stream constantly, so I'll be able to answer every question you could possibly have on your quest to become the ultimate bearer of the plague. Thanks for watching, have fun, and I'll see you next time.